Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Why Does Diversity Matter? Hosted by HRDQU and presented by Kira Godfrey. My name is Sarah, and I will moderate today's webinar. The webinar will last about an hour, so if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat area in your GoToWebinar control panel, and then we'll either answer them as they come in, if we can, or after the session by email. Today's webinar content is from our reproducible training library, the title Appreciating Diversity. If you are interested in delivering this training within your organization, please contact HRDQ. Our presenter today is Kira Godfrey. With 15 years experience, Kira is a change management and training consultant helping organizations connect, build, and invest in their greatest assets, people. Whether re-engineering business processes, implementing a new information system, or augmenting staff, taking care of people is critical to success. In 2010, Kira founded Naris Communications, a company that specializes in designing training programs, developing stakeholder communications, and delivering leadership training to support organizational transformation, performance improvement, and information system implementations. Welcome, Kira, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sarah, and hello, everyone. I am so excited to be with you today. Um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Kira Godfrey, and I will be your facilitator for today's webinar entitled, Why Does Diversity Matter? This is an interactive session, as we will be using the polling feature, as well as the, uh, the chat room. So I hope you had your afternoon coffee and you're ready for some fun. Let's get started. So a survey by Corn Ferry International uh, found that more than 2 million people leave their jobs each year because of unfairness in the workplace, costing employers an estimated $64 billion a year in hiring costs. I want to share with you a few concepts about diversity that should help you on your journey as you determine how to approach diversity awareness and diversity training at your organization. So here's our agenda for today. We'll talk about why is diversity awareness important. We'll also talk about behaviors that create the separation. So, uh, specifically, we'll talk about bias and stereotyping. And then also we'll talk about um, how to foster a culture of inclusion um, at the organizational level, as well as at the individual level. Then we'll also talk about the concept of leading by example. And then we will um, also give you a moment to jot down a few questions in the chat. So let's begin. Let's begin with a definition of diversity. So what exactly is diversity? Diversity is simply the condition of having or being composed of different elements. So when we talk about that, we usually think about variety. It, it's also the an inclusion of different types of people, such as people of different races or cultures in a group or organization programs, um, programs intended to promote inclusion and diverse ideas. And I want you to pay close attention um, when we talk about diversity, this definition of inclusion of different types of people. And we see here that we, we only mention races and culture. Now that we have a sense of what is diversity, let's talk about why is diversity awareness important. Diversity awareness is a business strategy that has been shown to increase an organization's ability to achieve better bottom line performance and sustain its growth and prosperity. Um, it is most effective when it's focused on increasing opportunity for personal and organizational achievement. According to a McKinsey study, racially diverse companies outperform others by 35%. Millennials, view uh, cognitive diversity as a necessity. Um, it's a necessary element in innovation and are 71% more likely to focus on teamwork. So in fact, millennials expect diversity. 83% of millennials are actively engaged um, when they believe their organization fosters an inclusive culture. 
compared to only 60% of millennials who are actively engaged when their organization does not foster an inclusive culture. So research also suggests that having high levels of awareness before training can lead to more engagement in diversity related programs. So pre-training competence levels at a, um, had a positive effect on both outcomes. So in essence, more competent uh, trainees express more interest in additional training and were more likely to attend voluntary uh, sessions. So having a, div uh, a diversity awareness before the training is very important and can be ben beneficial to your organization. So let's talk about some of the sources of unfair treatment and differences among people in organizations. Why is this topic of diversity and inclusion so important in today's society? Traditional diversity awareness programs have focused on the treatment of women and minorities. However, differences arise from a host of other traits, as well as uh, we can include age, uh, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, physical abilities, educational background, whether someone has children or not, even being an engineer versus being a salesperson can also um, create some unfair treatment. These traits or profiles cause people to make inaccurate assumptions. It creates separation and yes, treat people unfairly. The goal of diversity awareness is simply to promote an inclusive work environment. So with this as our foundation, let's, let's go a little bit further and shed light on behaviors that create separation. And then we'll move on to talk about some of the um, behaviors that foster inclusion. So whether uh, knowing or unknowingly, we are all at one time have an, or at another time, we are fallen prey to behaviors that uh, create separation. It is human nature. But let's begin to expose some of these behaviors um, so we can make different choices uh, when we are presented with these behaviors again. A study published by the American Psych uh, Sociological Association looked at 829 companies over a 30 year period. It found that diversity training had no positive effect in the average workplace. So researchers then at the University of Minnesota summarized the ASA's findings, the American uh, Sociological Association findings by saying, in firms where training is mandatory or emphasizes the, the threat of lawsuits, training actually has negative impact on management diversity. And let's talk about why, because I'm sure many of you are thinking, really? Yes, yeah, so let, let's talk about why that is the case. So here's the reason. So when people are divided into categories to demonstrate diversity, it reinforces the idea of categories or groups of people. Um, and it also reinforces separation. So in cases, uh, in these cases, instead of changing people's attitudes, diversity training solidifies them. It essentially showed you are a group and you are a group and you are a group. And so in doing that historically, when you've seen cases such as uh, affirmative action cases, they were put in place to compensate for pervasive and entrenched discrimination that prevented women and minorities from succeeding in the workplace. So as a result, the emphasis was on integrating groups of people into that white male dominated workplace. So today, although people don't want to, to be discriminated against, most also don't want to be labeled as a certain type or a certain group and would prefer to be treated as an individual. So many times the training of the past in diversity grouped people and they highlighted the differences. And so we're saying here that creating that awareness had the opposite effect in terms of bringing people together. So also here, the bottom line is that diversity is not about just integrating people, uh, which if effectively involves uh, pointing out specific groups of people, but it's about cultivating meaningful relationships, interacting with others in a way that is respectful and genuine. 
regardless of their type. So regardless of the group you win, you're looking at the individual. The solution is to teach people how to treat each person as an individual, how to communicate and resolve conflict with anyone, and also how to resist the urge to compare others to yourself, saying this person is like me or this group is like me. It's just talking more about inclusion. So like I said before, it is truly human nature to be biased. So when we talk about bias here, we're talking about uh, a prejudice in favor of or against one thing, um, a thing, a person, a group compared to another. And it's usually in a way that's considered um, to be unfair. So bias comes becomes um, unproductive when we allow it to control our decision making without questioning our assumptions. Rather than thinking we can eliminate all our biases, a better approach I would like to suggest is that we make conscious efforts to address them by questioning the, the validity um, of our assumptions and choosing behaviors that support fairness and equity. Using technology um, like AI to avoid unconscious, be, uh, um, unconscious bias. So bias related to demographics such as race, gender, age can be triggered by, by the information, even on a resume, such as a candidate's name and the dates they have held previous positions. And I'm sure many of you have seen that. So in 2018, an AI adoption for diversity, um, when we look at AI and, and artificial intelligence, is definitely one of the hot topics of today. But it can be programmed to avoid this unconscious bias um, by ignoring certain demographic information when sourcing candidates and, or screening re um, resumes. So furthermore, as we look at even in the technology um, like AI, it can be tested for bias by checking for, for demographic breakdowns of the applicant um, and, and, and during the sourcing and screening process. So I want to introduce also another concept called um, the fundamental attribution era. So what is this? This is an error that occurs when we explain someone's behavior based on a personality trait uh, rather than uh, external circumstances. So here's an example. So you pass a colleague in the hallway and you say hello, but the other person doesn't respond. So you think to yourself that she is rude or stuck up, but sometimes she, uh, but perhaps maybe that person just received some bad news and, and so they're preoccupied with that information and maybe she just didn't hear you. Another common example is, is what you say uh, to yourself about uh, other drivers on the road. So usually if someone's driving behavior irritates you, <laughs> you say that person is a bad driver. What if that driver is from out of town and is struggling with directions? So when we make these assumptions, we call this the fundamental attribution error. And so let's talk about how can we identify this in our behavior. So if you ask yourself, do I make assumptions about others based on their profile, their gender, their age, their race, their religion, their occupation? Do I treat two or more employees the same because uh, they share a similar characteristic? Do I attribute uh, or attribute uh, someone's success or failure to an inherent trait? So if you can answer yes to any of these questions, you may have made a fundamental attribution error. So we all know that uh, stereotyping, where you group people by simplistic, often inaccurate generalizations, is unproductive and can result in unfair treatment or discrimination. So recent research has found that people stereotype others in more subtle ways. So a study completed by uh, psychologists at Princeton University found that uh, stereotypes tend to be characterized in terms of warmth or lack thereof or components or lack thereof. So when we talk about warmth, warmth is defined as whether a person had positive or negative intentions. 
And then competence is defined as how effective a person is, was um, how effective they were at fulfilling those intentions. So stereotyping then, uh, it tends to group people um, in these terms and it is definitely unproductive. So let's get, let's talk about a little bit about the subtle stereotyping. So a positive judgment in one's dimension, um, usually accompanied by a negative judgment in the other dimension. So that's what it is when we talk about stereotyping, is positive judgment in one dimension. And of course, the reverse side of that is having a negative judgment in another dimension. So obviously, when uh, people's perspectives, when they are influenced by the, the warmth, competent judgments, um, which may or may not be accurate. So these perspectives may have poor outcomes. So here's an example. So for example, so the finance department in your organization may be a stereotyped as high competence and low warmth. They, they do their job well, but they're basically, you know, you may feel like they're, they're not on your side. So if that is the perspective in your organization, then they may have trouble finding people to mentor them and to help them grow in the organization because there's this judgment there about who they are. So unfair treatment isn't always in the form of blatant discrimination. In fact, it is more likely to occur in the form of a small subconscious behaviors uh, that result in, in creating this type of separation. Experiencing these behaviors on a regular basis cause the recipient to feel devalued. So Mary Rowe, she's a researcher at MIT, she coined the phrase micro inequities to describe this phenomenon. So let's talk about a few examples of micro inequities. So when you give feedback to one employee uh, more frequently than others, that's an example. When you um, always eating lunch with the same person or same group of people, that can be an example, as well as habitual seating arrangements in a meeting that don't allow others to, to sit close to a leader. Assuming a female employee doesn't want to work with a client requiring conference calls at, at odd hours because she is a new mother, just making that assumption on your own, uh, that can be an example as well. In a company called Ernst & Young, they, uh, they discovered micro inequities in how, they, how their firm assigned jobs. So in this case, women were assigned to nonprofit clients while men were assigned to the Fortune 500 companies, uh, which in turn did affect promotions. So that was an example of micro inequities. So here are a few practical examples of behaviors that can cause others to feel uh, devalued. So not making eye, uh, direct eye contact when shaking someone's hand or barging in on someone's workspace without asking permission, interrupting uh, someone while they're talking, uh, ne neglecting to invite someone to a meeting, excluding someone from a group activity, it can even be, as we look at this list, leaving someone out of a conversation. You're standing there and you know someone else comes up and leaving them out of a conversation. That can make others feel devalued. Or um, consistently mispronouncing someone's name. <laughs> that, is, that happens a lot. And that can make somebody feel uh, devalued when you can easily go to them you know, and say, hey, please, um, how, do we, how do you pronounce your name? And just asking that question on the sidelines. Uh, relying on uh, the same trusted colleagues for advice instead of uh, seeking new perspectives. That can also uh, make someone feel devalued. And you see here so far, we really talk about things and, and hopefully as you're listening, you're, you're thinking through like, yeah, you know, I, I can see that or maybe I felt that way before. So let's go a little bit further and talk about uh, some of the antidotes and some of the things you can do. So a positive judgment, when we talk about uh, micro affirmations, we're talking about a positive judgment in someone's um, dimension was usually accompanied by a negative one. But let's talk about some things that we can do um, to alleviate that. So here are some examples. Um, offering 
um, offering public and private recognition, that can help. Also by um, giving credit to others, delivering clear and consistent feedback, that also can be a, a, a factor that can help deal with those micro inequ inequities. Again, as you see here, these are very small acts, things you can do to help others succeed and feel valued. Uh, soliciting opinions and input, greeting everyone, um, asking questions and listening carefully, um, having lunch with someone, someone different, someone new, uh, mixing up the seating arrangements during a meeting, and then also um, connecting on a personal level. Those are definitely things you can do to help others succeed and feel more value. So throughout this, I told you that it's going to be an interactive session. So now let's take a minute here to use the polling feature and we have a uh, test your knowledge. So we talked about subtle stereotyping tends to be characterized and how it's characterized and what is it. So here's the question. So subtle stereotyping tends to be characterized by which of the following two traits? A, intelligence and skill. B, personality and sense of humor. C, warmth and competence, or D, work ethic and sincerity. So go ahead and use the polling feature that popped up and to answer the question. All right. Okay. So let's see. Let's see what's the right answer. I see 74% uh, had C. Let's see if that's correct. And you are correct, yes. Um, the answer is C. And remember that that warmth and the warmth is defined by whether a person had a positive or negative intentions. And then also the confidence was defined by how effective a person was at fulfilling those intentions. So that's the subtle stereotyping. Wonderful. All right, let's move on. So let's talk about then, uh, now that we have these I an idea of the behaviors that can cause this separation, let's move further and talk about how to foster this culture of inclusion. Again, not focusing on the different groups, but now we're focusing on inclusion, okay? So let's move on here. So diversity awareness in the workplace has evolved from focusing solely on eliminating discrimination uh, to proactively seeking this inclusion. So that is valuing each um, employee for his or her unique contributions to the organization. And creating a framework for inclusion begins with the organizational culture. So what I want to go through is to talk to you then about some of the, the framework for this organizational inclusion. I want to talk about in, to give you an activity and then also uh, just go through an example of that. So one of the activities can be uh, to demonstrate a desire to seek diverse perspectives at all levels. And so an example of that you can do is um, switching positions among employees at various levels uh, for half a day to see what new perspectives they can bring to that position. So that's something definitely you can do. Also, uh, find the unique skills of each individual and capitalize on them. An example can be um, allow employees to contribute um, outside their regular job responsibilities. Another thing you can do is uh, establish a buddy system that connects each new employee with a veteran employee to who we call just show them the ropes. And in doing this, you can an example can be uh, share insights about the organizational culture and norms, um, be a point of contact for questions. So the, the that veteran employee can be a point of contact for questions or even soliciting feedback. Um, on their experience as a new employee. So having this dialogue between uh, the new employee and the veteran employee through this buddy system. So again, these are great ways at the organizational level how you can um, approach inclusion. Also here are a few more. So find a, a non-bureaucratic way uh, 
to challenge the status quo. So when I say non-bureaucratic, I'm referring to um, ways that you don't have to go through many channels um, within the organization to get permission. So these are simple ways. And one thing you can do is encourage all employees to make a small change in their work routine. Another example or another activity is to foster an atmosphere of flexibility and learning. And I love this one uh, because an example of this one can just be simply to, you know, have a teach your boss day where employees teach their bosses something new that their bosses did not know. And you can do this either through a lunch and learn session or just really informal. Also, I love this other one too, because we don't do this many times in a lot of organizations, which is being willing to admit mistakes and weaknesses and vulnerabilities. Uh, so a, a wonderful way to do this is to maybe to schedule monthly gatherings to award a you know mistake of the month where employees compete by sharing a mistake they made and how they fixed it or how they will avoid it in the future. Again, this is a wonderful way of uh, fostering an uh, organizational inclusion. So I want to move on a little bit and talk about the work design, the workplace design, which is another way that you can foster this organizational inclusion. And so if you have the ability to influence the physical layout of your organization, I want to share with you just a few ways to foster a more inclusive environment. So you can create a common uh, space where employees can interact easily and informally. And I know many of the, the workplaces of today have this space. So if you don't, you please, um, I encourage you to try to create that if you can or consider larger tables in the, in the break or lunch rooms uh, where more people can mix at a, at a time. That's also very helpful. And also here's another example you can, uh, or another idea, you can consider needs of different populations and profiles. So maybe a, a space for nursing mothers or a few ergonomic adjustments for older employees. Um, so those can be quite helpful as well as you lo look around and consider, hey, what, what can I do at an organizational level to foster a culture of inclusion? So as we've said, diversity is ultimately about relationships. So uh, it's up to every individual to help create and maintain an inclusive atmosphere. So it's all of our responsibilities. So I wanna to talk to you about um, some uh, specific ways to do this. And so here's another one way, um, take the time to get to know a new employee's background, you know, find out about their work history, their experience, their education, their interest. Also, you can share your own background and experiences with others, especially with people who are different from you. Also solicit different uh, perspectives before making a decision that impacts your work unit asking others for their opinion. Also, perhaps have lunch with or socialize with someone outside of your, your usual group. You can also actively seek to understand the viewpoint of someone who may disagree with you. And I know that you, that may seem hard, but you know, just again, having a conversation during lunch or, hey, let's go to lunch. I see that we uh, disagreed on a certain topic. I, I would like to understand why or you know, understand a little bit deeper about your perspective. So having a conversation. Also adapt your communication or your working style to show uh, you respect the person that you're working with. And that can easily be in some cases where um, I, I know in many workplaces, you may have instant message where you're either using Skype for business and you know someone loves to use the, the, uh, the video. And there are many employees that don't like that. So maybe you can look at, well, what do employees like or what does your colleague uh, may not like and making adjustments there. That's really simple. And also uh, take the time to resolve a conflict uh, so that both sides feel as if um, their needs are being met. 
So now let's talk quickly then about some employee behaviors that can contribute to this in inclusion at the employee level. So you can um, uh, adapt to different working styles, approaches to communications and preferences for interacting. Again, like we talked about, you know, if, if there is a, a, a instance where, you know, you're using instant message, but then there may be an employee that really likes face-to-face -face communication. Um, maybe you have a, a dinner celebration, but then there are employees who may have um, uh, other obligations after work. So perhaps moving that to a lunch, um, a lunch engagement instead. Communicating respect, uh, respectfully and effectively. These are again, these are individual ways that employees can uh, make an adjustment because one person can make a difference. So also treating every person as a unique individual, um, trying to encourage all coworkers to participate in informal and formal meetings. And then on the manager level, here are some things you can do. You can also um, uh, understand how personal preferences may affect the personnel decisions that you may have, um, such as who gets promoted or who gets assigned to the good projects. Um, the bottom line here is just make fair HR decisions. Also coaching and mentoring individuals who may be struggling to engage with others, um, manage uh, employees individually. So getting to know their personalities, their unique skills, their interests, and making decisions based on employees uh, in their individual skills and abilities and matching that to the, the task requirements. In this case, we're really talking about Avoid assigning employees to projects just based on their age or their gender or their culture. So also, I want to talk a little bit about um, showing respect. So the, the dictionary refine, uh, defines respect as having due regard or feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of. It's showing respect is perhaps one of the most I would say the, the vital components of maintaining an inclusive work environment. Um, there are different ways to do that. And there's also, when we look at direct versus indirect, some people prefer direct eye contact and straightforward conversations and some people don't. Um, also, when we look at time, time is a factor that some people believe um, that being on time shows respect and being late shows disrespect. Um, others believe people are more important than time and, and not to worry about being late for an appointment or a meeting if they're spending time with someone. And so and I know many of you know people um, who feel that way. So here's uh, also when we look at respect, we can look at it uh, from an individual versus group. Uh, some people value individual achievement and recognition, while others value group achievement and group recognition. So those who may value then the group achievement may be unwilling to make a decision on their own because they, they feel that if they make a decision on their own, they're disrespecting um, the rest of the group. Also um, on the level of hierarchy, some people respect positions and status levels more than others. So as a result, these people um, may not speak up around higher ups or uh, people with higher level positions because they feel that it's disrespectful to speak up or to challenge an opinion um, among those people. So if the higher ups don't share this value, then they may judge the employee negatively for not speaking up. So again, we're, we're talking about these differences in, in how you to show respect, but you can see where it can really depend on your organization. So really understanding um, the organization and having conversation about these different viewpoints on respect can prove helpful as you um, conducting your training on diversity. So let's also talk about the reserve versus emotional. So some people believe that showing strong emotion signals a, a loss of control and therefore um, they may lack respect for others who may do that. And on the other hand, others believe that strong emotions show that you care and that you value and respect others enough to be open with them. 
So you can see where they can easily become uh, be conflict in the workplace just by your differences of opinion, even when you talk about conveying a wonderful thing like respect. So, so this is not um, um, one of the easiest thing. However, um, I, I do think that just by having conversations, this can become, um, it may not be comfortable, let's put it that way, it may not be comfortable, but it is one of the easiest um, and most important ways to show respect to others. And here's what we can do. And we, especially during that communication, listen carefully first and encourage others to share their opinion and their ideas and when they're doing that don't interrupt many times when you're when you're communicating with others and someone is talking even though you're listening uh, but sometimes you're not listening you're just waiting for a pause so you can say what you want to say or you're you're listening because you you just like oh I, i'm ready to say something or i want to have a rebuttal to what they're saying but try not to interrupt and truly listen to what they're saying first and then also you can adjust your style to match the other person's preferences um, the best way to find out someone's preference is by simply asking them what is the best way I, I want to communicate with you I want to share ideas I want to hear your ideas what is the best way that I can do that what's your preference and that's simply by asking a question so consider uh, what to say um, whatever you say it should be true it should be necessary and it should be helpful if you put that if you put whatever you're going to say through those filters you should be okay uh, never insult others um, avoid nitpicking, criticizing, um, insignificant things, the things that don't really matter, or avoid sounding um, demeaning or judgmental when you're when you're speaking. And again, we're talking about ways to come how you communicate with respect. And these are things again that foster this inclusive culture. So you've heard it before: conflict is inevitable. And it is true. So this is especially true in a diverse environment uh, where employees have different values, different work styles, different preferences for um, communicating. Uh, like we just talked about, different ideas of what respect is. Um, so also employees tend to have different ways of dealing with or avoiding conflict. So it's important to address conflict especially in a way that is respectful, as well as in a way that that in some cases resolve the conflict. So let's talk a little bit about uh, laying this groundwork. So successful and respectful uh, conflict resolutions, it requires you to do something simple like um, acknowledge that diversity related issues may be con contributing to the uh, to the conflict itself. Um, and also admitting or uh, once you admit to that, then you now you're looking for ways of how can you um, discuss the issue with the person and also determine how you both perceive it. So again, having these type of conversations and, and laying the groundwork. Also, you know, ask, is the issue a conflict? Uh, what feels like a tense conflict to one person um, may feel like an um, animated discussion to another person. Sometimes I'm sure you've seen people talking and you're like, oh my goodness, they're having a heated, um, uh, they're arguing. But no, they're just having a animated discussion. It may be somebody who just moved their hands a lot or, you know, you have people uh, you may know even in your family that they just speak loud <laughs> and you think, oh my goodness, are they angry? No, they just speak loud. And so, you know, making sure that what you may perceive to be a conflict is really um, a conflict. So again, more of talking about laying the groundwork, um, you know, acting good faith believe that the other person wants a positive, productive outcome as much as you do. So you're going in, into a situation um, just believing that the best, believing the best of the other person. So share your observations 
uh, with an uh, added uh, attitude of openness and curiosity. So, for example, instead of saying, uh, um, why did you take credit for an idea? You can say something like, you have good ideas on your own. That's why it surprised me that you shared my idea with the team as if it was yours. So there is a certain way to frame um, the information that may be better received. And so also uh, it's a good idea to separate substantive issues from just style differences. So this is where differences in how people approach conflict show up. So for example, uh, some people focus um, on the facts while others value discussing their feelings about an issue. And, and that's a different approach to how conflict can be, um, may arise and how it can be um, also dealt with. So decide how to approach the conflict resolution process. And you can do this together. You can also, also um, maybe try to have a third party mediator if, if necessary. So again, when we look at laying the groundwork and we look at inclusion and diversity, we're also talking about how to deal with the inevitable conflict that may, that may exist. So also um, consider these possible causes. Uh, maybe it's the absence of information or somebody's been misinformed. Uh, maybe there's just a, a power struggle or, you know, there is a, you may, you may work in a stressful environment and that can simply cause conflict on its own. Um, there may be incompatible goals where some, someone on a team is trying to achieve something else and um, another person had a different interpretation of what the goal was. Uh, identify the needs of each side you know, asking questions like, you know, what do I want? Um, what does the other person want? What solutions uh, would need, uh, would, would, what do we need in order to get to a solution? Or just simply, where, where do we have common ground? That's a great way to start when you're dealing with conflict. And also um, consider just achieving a disagreement. And in many cases we call this, you know, sometimes you just agree to disagree. We agree that we disagree on this, this uh, issue right here. And sometimes that can also uh, be a great way to resolve conflict just by agreeing to disagree. All right, I know we covered a lot. And so let's, let's do this. Let's take an, another moment for, let's test your knowledge here. So, which of the following is an effective way to convey respect to others? Uh, A, offer recognition for both individual and group achievement. B, always make direct contact so others don't feel like you're avoiding them. C, insist uh, that everyone is always on time because being late is a sign of disrespect. Also, or is it D, Always show lots of emotion so people know you are enthused. So which one is it? Which of the following is an effective way to convey respect for others? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see which one. We have 71% feels like it's A and okay, someone says D. Okay. Let's see. 1% has D. All right, let's see the answer. The answer is A. To offer recognition for both individual and group achievements. This is a great way to show respect for others. All right. All right, let's move on here. So let's talk a little bit about leading by example. So when we talk about leading um, by example here, so sometimes in, in some situations you may have employees or even yourself, uh, you may, may feel uh, emotional um, as though you're lacking control of your feelings because someone has offended you um, and giving feedback on his or her behavior can be difficult. 
So at the same time, receiving feedback on a behavior you may have done or another, uh, another colleague may have done can be just as difficult. So giving that information, also being the recipient of the information can be difficult because our natural reaction is to be defensive or to become defensive. So I would like to uh, take the, the few moments we have together to talk about um, how to offer and then how to receive um, when you're being confronted by a negative behavior that somebody has done to you or maybe you have done and somebody's confronting you about it. So let's talk about how to give feedback. So when you're giving feedback, so approach others directly. So don't gossip or go behind their backs or, you know, go to another colleague and talk about it or, you know, constantly doing that. Um, but really go to the person directly and you want to keep it simple and, and stick to the one issue at a time. If they did multiple things, <laughs> uh, then maybe um, just talk about one at a time, though. And be sure to use words, the I statements. I'm sure many of you heard the I statements. And this is where you, you, you add uh, specific examples about how the behavior has offended you. Um, so you can start off, I felt, and whatever that feeling is, um, when, and of course here we want to describe the behavior um, you would like instead. So I felt whatever way when you did and whatever they did. And then you describe, well, what, what is it that you would like to have experience instead? And then you check check for understanding and, and see if they understood what you were trying to say. And so that's a great way on how you can uh, deliver or give feedback on someone's behavior that may have offended you. On the other side, <laughs> there is the other side of when you're the person who um, is receiving this, this feedback, you know, try to be open and, and non-defensive about it because, again, the person is sharing how they felt. Um, this is how they perceived the action or the words that were spoken. So you may want to ask for uh, specific examples if, if none were given. So, uh, again, when you're giving it, you say, when you did this, this is how I feel. And if the person doesn't provide it in that context, then you can ask for a specific example. So accept the other person's uh, perception as real to them. In other words, you know, don't try to tell them uh, that they're being sensitive or they shouldn't feel that way. Just, you know, trying to disqualify the feeling. They're sharing with you how they felt and you should take it on as, as valid. Also, when you're receiving this information, you can summarize what the other person said to show that you understood uh, them accurately. So you can parrot back to them just to make sure, hey, so when I did this, you felt this certain way. Um, and again, you're, you're saying it by not trying to discredit that feeling that they have. And then also what you can do is um, commit to engaging in behavior that they requested. So they're sharing with you, this is what you did, and here is the behavior that I, I would like. And then you're, you're going to give that commitment that, yes, I, I'll do that. I'll do that. So with that, this is a short one. So let's test your knowledge. Which of the following is the best way to respond to someone who gives you feedback? A, accept their criticism even if they don't give any examples. B, be open and non-defensive. C, explain how they misunderstood you. D, tell them that they are too sensitive. So which is the fault which of the following is the best way to respond to someone who gives you feedback? And this is the first time this has happened. 100% of, of the respondents said, 100% of you said B. And the correct answer is B. So you want to be open and non-defensive when, uh, when someone is giving you feedback. Excellent.
Okay, so I really hope this webinar provided insights about the importance of diversity and how you can bring diversity awareness uh, to your organization. So I just want to go over a quick summary of the things we covered here. So these are your takeaways. Diversity is not about um, integration, um, which again, which involves pointing out specific groups of people, but it's about cultivating a meaningful relationships, which is interacting with others in a way that is respectful and genuine, regardless of their type. Establish your framework to increase inclusion at the organizational level. I gave you many examples. Um, so you can choose which one may fit your organization. So you want to establish this framework. Also recognize different ways of conveying respect uh, to others. Um, and, and knowing that there may be difference of opinion in terms of how uh, respect is conveyed. Um, address conflict um, productively and respectfully. And also um, lead by example, be a part of the, the solution and how feedback and being able to uh, demonstrate how to give feedback as well as how to receive feedback. So this ends our session for today. Thank you so much for joining me. And Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kira. That was great. We appreciate you looking to HRDQ for your training needs. Um, we publish research-based experiential learning products that you can deliver in your organization. So check out our online or print self-assessments. Uh, we have up out of your seat games, our reproducible workshops that you can customize, um, just like our Appreciating Diversity title, which is the foundation of today's webinar. And we have lots more. So either check out our website or give our customer service team a call. Um, they know our products really well and are happy to um, guide you through some options. And if you do need help um, learning a training program or you want one of our expert trainers like Kira to come on site or virtually deliver it for you, we also provide those services. We look forward to being your soft skills training resource. So that's all the time we have today. Thank you, Kira, for the dynamic presentation. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in today's webinar. Happy training.